Chapter 5 The Prison We Broke by Baby Kamle There were about 16 houses in our Maharwara. All the people of the Maharwara were illustrate. Except, except for my Ajja, he was an educated man. I had three Ajjas from my mother's side and all of them spoke excellent English. They had lived in cities like Pune and Mumbai and interestingly they had all worked as butlers. It was because of their association with the European Sahib that they could speak English so well. Whenever my Ajja Sahib got transferred to a different city, my Ajja moved along with him. His salary was 16 rupees a month. His uh, butler clothes used to look so elegant. The butterfly was the beautifully pressed white uniform, uh, the white coat and turban on his head with a brass buckle pinned to, in that, to it then that hung down on his forehead. The red shas around the waist and another red shas wrapped from under the arm over the chest. The, the villagers would be so impressed. He uh, appeared no less than a minister to them. He did not have to spend uh, anything on his food and other necessities as almost everything was available to him free of cost. As his salary of 16 rupees remained unspent, he used to send my grandmother a money uh, order for 10 rupees every month. A man getting a salary of 16 rupees every month was a unique phenomena in the village. The money uh, order would be a, a heated topic for discussion everywhere, both in the Maharwada as well as in the locality of the higher caste of the village. The day the money order was received would be extremely eventful. The entire community would flock at the uh, chowdi in a state of palpable excitement. They would talk, talk and talk. When the postman came, they would uh, stare a go. Everyone would take the postman aside and whisper secretly how much people would come to our house to escort my Ajji to the Chaudi. When I, as Abhi call out grandmother, arrived at the Chaudi, uh, there would be a hustle and bustle. Everyone for more excited than any of us family members. The discussion would continue longer after she could collect the amount and gone home. Look like mal Malari is in a far away land. Of course, another would explain. He's educated, isn't he? That's why he has found a job with the white sahib. And so Site Kaku gets a money order of 10 rupees every month. 10 rupees will you ever be able to even see such a sum in your lifetime. Besides, wh wherever he goes, he sends uh, her saris, ornaments and whatnot. You know he can write very well too and oh my, the way he chats with his sahib. In the, in the sahib's own tongue, you know. He is a special one. I tell you, our Malari and you know what. He has brought what wonderful books from that place. What do you call it? Kashmir. They have everything about gods and a holy matters. You can even find out what about medicine and things of that sort in, that, in those books. If he ever visit our place, Virgao, who will be able to say that he is smart. He looks so smart, just like a king. Tulsa and Kasa used to live high, right in front of our house. They were sister-in-laws. Both women were uh, around 50 years of age. Their hair, never touched by a, a comb, was completely white and lay tangled on their head like a basket turned upside down. Th their saris were rags and their blouse were tatters. Poverty oozed out of their house as it were. Every day they would come and square at our doorstep in the tender morning sun. They would sit there for hours enjoying the sun, scratching their heads like mad with bo bo both hands and searching for life's crowd about in their tattered clothing. Around 10 o'clock they would pick up their basket and brooms and set off towards the Mahar household where they cleaned and the animal fence. They would return in the afternoon with a couple of baskets full of leftover food. These leftovers saw their family throat till the next morning, for that was they uh, ate for basket, breakfast, lunch and dinner. Their family include um, Kasa's husband, uh, Ganpat and their two children, Bip, um, Bapya and Hossi. The children were just like their parents with their same good 
a careless attitude. When Tulsa was taken ill and had to lie in bed for a couple of weeks, one day she left a terrible craving for the uh, bomb, bomb bill fish. But where was the money to buy it? Now my Aji had just received her money order. When Tulsa heard about this, she came to my Aji and said, uh, Sita, ya Sita, Sita ya Vahini, I am dying to eat Bombil, but I have no money. Lend me a guinea. I will return after I will sell some firewood. I immediately gave her an anna. Tulsa brought some Bombil worth two paisa, a little oil and some chilies worth half a paisa each. Since she had lost her appetite, she also added a little a chana, dhania, seed some jaggery worth a damri and little uh, raw turmeric. With this, she prepared a concoction to add a little taste. By the time she returned after shopping, it was nearly evening. She placed the bombillo on the chulas to roast. When the ch children smelled the roasting fish, they raised bell. They squatted down on the floor, thrusting their feet widely, demanding to eat the fish. Tulsha gave them a piece each with some of salt bakri. Delighted, the, ki the kids ran out, parked the themselves on the heap of the firewood and started eating their favorite dish with the relish. Halsey and her fish fast, but Bapi ate his sparingly, in fact did not eat it all. He just put it in mouth along the piece of salt. Bakri pretended to chew it but eventually brought it out again because he wanted to eat it only after his sister had finished her so that he could annoy her. Uh, soon after Havzi finished her fish, he started teasing her, wiping his sticky nose with his wrists, he started to sing, Oh silly monkey sitting on the gate, I fell, fall at my feet, but this isn't, this you won't get. The song which called her a monkey annoyed Havzi. The angrier she became, the, mo the more Bappe teased animal amid all this commoration. The fish on Bapya's uh, bakri rolled down and disappeared somewhat in the wood heap. When Bapi noticed that fish was gone, he lost her hat, beating his fist again uh, his mouth, and he climbed down from the heap of food. Then, howling and screaming badly, started running around the heap in circle, crying to retrieve his lost fish. house. he followed him. Their collective screaming brought out their parents, and they too stared, looking for the fish. The voices added to the, uh, to the racket and all the neighboring anxious rushed out of their house to uh, find out what was happening. They feared that uh, something terrible had happened. They kept calling out loudly to make themselves heard amid the sin. What's wrong? Did something bite you or what? Finally, their voices managed to penetrate the din and Peppy told them what had happened. Every day was so amused that they burst out laughing. The kid, of course, were a chip of the old block. The uh, Ganpat Dada was quite a character. It was the Nagappa, Nagap, Nagapanchini festival. When would uh, need a snake out of mud, keep it in the corner of the house where the god were kept. They would worship the snake for prayers and then immerse it in the stream before they ate in the afternoon. This was the custom on one day. Tulsa and Kasa had collected leftover chapatis from the various households and kept them in a small cane basket. Tulsa told her brother Dada, I have kept the chapatis here and a piece of jaggery in the alco. You can mix the chapatis and jaggery for basket and give some to children as well. Tulsa and Kasa left for cleaning the pens. Ganpat Dada took down the tangri, poured uh, two pots full of water into it and instead of jaggery took out the mud uh, finger of Nag, na, nag nas, Narsoba and put in the weapon. He kneeled it with his finger till it dissolved in the water. Next, he took out the chapatis and uh, breaking them into small pieces, mixed them well in the mud. He gave a plateful of this mixture to Bepi and Auzi who gobbled it with thai. Uh, with much relish licking not only their fingers but their elbow as well, where the muddy mixture had tickled down. When Tulsa Kasa returned. Kasa settled, dropping in uh, Alko, looking for the Nag Narsoba, which had to be immersed before they had their food. But all their had gaping fingers could find a small piece of jaggery where was the Narsoba. 
Intrigued, she confirmed her husband. Tell me, did you crush Narsova instead of Jaggery in the water? Oh my, what is this Narsova? Of course, it was there in Alcoob. Then I must have mixed the Narsova instead of Jaggery with the Chapati, so that's why Chapatis didn't taste sweet. Uh, such was condition of the people. We were just like animals, but without a uh, tail. Without tail. We could be called human only because we had uh, two legs instead of four. Otherwise, there was no difference between us and animal. But how had we been reduced to this uh, bestie, that, that bestial state? Who was responsible? Who else? But people of the high caste, they destroyed our uh, reasoning, our ability to think. We were reduced to the condition far worse than that of the, uh, the bullocks kept in the courtyard of the high of the high caste. Uh, the bullocks were at least given some uh, dry grass to eat, but the bullocks uh, ate the grass and slog for their master, but were merely given leftovers. We ate the leftovers without complaining and labors for, the, for others. The only difference, however, was that beasts could eat a bellyful and they could say, they could stay their master's courtyard, but our condition was far worse. Our place was in the in the garbage pits outside the village. There, everyone threw away their waste. That was where we lived in our poor huts amidst all this filth. We were masters only of the dead animals thrown into those pits by the high caste. We had to fight with the cats and dogs and kites and kites and vultures to establish our rights over the carcasses. To tear off the flesh down from the dead bodies, our lives were governed by the various calamities. We were imprisoned in dark cells, our hands and feet bound by the chains of slavery. Our reasons were gagged, but it is because of us that the, the world stands. We ate the foundation, shallow water marked lots of no, uh, noise, but still water runs deep, then deep, like the ocean that the covers mountain of sins. Under his huge expense, we cover the sins of the high caste. This is why, like the ocean, deserve the admiration of the whole world. Our people in this village live in the ad, ad, abject poverty. They had absolutely no power, and yet their, their hearts were full of kindness and love for each other. Women would wake up with the cracks of the down. The grains would have been cleaned the uh, previous nights and kept ready as cooked down. The grinding scenes of each bout and... Uh, Viral. When my Ajji set the grinding stone, I would crawl out of my cover and put my hat on her lap. Our children did so. The women would pull down their palla, cover the sleeping children, and then pouring small quantities of grain into the opening of the small holes, they would start grinding. In the quiet of the early hours, the sound of the grinding stones had the sweet, uh, sweet notes of the women grinding would float, float all over the Maharwada. Every woman sing a song to the child child sleeping on the lap. The, sing would, the song would be full of love for the children and grandchildren, their brothers and sister-in-law, their father and their mothers. Though this, the, the song's women would praise them, all describing their good qualities. The song expressed their hope and conviction that the future was bright, their aspirations and the dream, which would never materialize, blossomed through the, these songs and melodious notes issuing forth the deep of their hearts. Baby, my daughter's child, is lovely like a flower. Averts your evil, O oh you wicked neighbor. It's your evil eyes that cast its spell on her. My tiny baby has got, oh such a burning fever. With salt and mustard seed, I will drive the spell away. Sleep sound on my lap, O oh my baby, O oh my sweet baby bye. In these songs, women sang about their children. Like fountain, their love sprung through the, these songs. Children bubbled with joy as the song had their names. I would sleep till Aji finished her grinding. Then I would shake the sleep of my eyes and get up. Aji would collect the flour, the floor around the stone with a small uh, kuncha. It would be daybreak by this time. Then, along with a couple of my friends, I would go to fetch water. We would carry uh, earthen peaches on our heads. Other girls would join us. We would walk by the banks of the stream up to the uh, jutting rocks with their it's originated. This rock was nearly 30 feet high. There was a cave inside this rock, a small stream flowed from the rocks inside the cave and people uh, had dug a channel to give its proper outlet. 
In this cave, we would dig into the bed of the stream which broken coconut shells and then begin to collect the water. Then steep through the sand till our pitchers got filled. To get inside the cave, we had to climb the steep rocks one by one and collect water by runs. Then we would wash our face in the stream. We would grind small pebbles with bigger stones into a fine powder and clean our uh, teeth white uh, with it. After I returned home, Aji would give me piping hot tea in the uh, piping hot tea in the glass along with previous night's stale bakri. The taste of that bakri still lingers on my tongue. The bakri tastes for better than the uh, orange biscuit that we have today. It was only in our house that tea was made. No one other house prepared tea. After a basket breakfast, Aji would go with the other woman to verse to weed gown, uh, them to fetch firewood. They collect firewood in the summer and grass in the winter. During the night, they would sharpen their eggs on the uh, stones, gather string and keep them in bundles and keep everything ready for the next day. In the morning, they would depart in a big uh, group. Children in Maharwada would be left to fend them themselves while their mothers were away. With nobody to discipline and take care of them, nobody knew whether they were alive or dead. Somebody would carelessly hurl a stone at someone else's head and blood would uh, gush out. One of them would put block, uh, black suit from the tawa on the wound uh, finished. The child would uh, wipe its running nose and rush back to the game over again. Around 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the woman would return, almost running in the uh, scorching heat with bundle of firewood on their head. The children would look for their own mother in the group of, and holding the pallav in their hands, follow them alone. The woman would be drenched with uh, sweat running down their bodies. Their throats would be part dry. They would find the shape, uh, shade of the tree, threw their burden down in the dust and squid down on the root. The children fetch water in a tin pot and the woman would pour it down their throat in great gulp. Uh, then they would return to their house and uh, look for the basket of the bakri. Most of the times that basket would be empty as the uh, children would be finished the bakri. Having had no breakfast in the morning and with no food in the house, hunger ground at their empty stomach like wildfire. And what could they eat? They would go looking for some crumbs in their friend's house, our house, and to be uh, to be storehouse for food as there was no one to else to eat except for my Archie and me. The Bakri were received for our duties as um, Yeshkar would be dying in the sun. Aji generally written dried these Bakri till they were crisp and stored them in big contain containers. Anyone who did not have food come to Aji. She was a very kind soul. The woman would keep their bundles of fire at the home and come to our house one by one. Aji would bring out the dried bakri and hand them over to the woman who put them on wooden plate. Half a basket of the onion would be brought out. Then all of us, my Aji, myself and woman, ate the stone-like dry bread with the raw onion to our heart's content. The peas would be so dry uh, that we collect munching would sound as loud as munching thunder, thundering in some factory. The woman ate the bakri with two or three uh, big onion and washed it down with a jug full of water, blanching contentedly by their return home. Now they had to break the firewood into small pieces. One, the big branch, were cut into small pieces. They dried them up this small bundle and carried them on their head to the village to sell them. They were not allowed to use the regular road and they were used by the higher caste. When somebody from these caste walked from the uh, opposite direction, the Mahar had to leave the road, climb down into uh, shrubbery shab and walk through the thrown bush on the roadside. They had to cover themselves fully if they saw any man from the higher caste coming down to the road. And when he came close, they had to say, the humble Mahar woman fall at your feet, master. That was like a chant which they had to repeat innumerable times, even to small child, if it belonged to a higher caste. So, uh, when children followed the woman holding that pala, sometimes there would be a young, new, newly, newly wed girl in the group, and she would fail to join the chant out of sheer ignorance and awkwardness. All hell would break loose them. The master would simply explode their in rage. He would march straight to the Mahar Chaudi 
summon all the mahars, uh, there the kids up uh, a big fuss. Who just tell them who was hell in that new girl? Doesn't she know that she has to bow down to the master? Shameless bitch, how dare she pass me without showing due respect? Then the girl Sara, Sasra and other elderly men from the community would fall in the men's feet and that's under supplication, begging for mercy. No, no kind master, the girl is new, animal in the herd, quite foolish and ignorant if she has erred. Uh, Sasra, fall your feet and please. Then the girl Sasra, no, you master are transgressing your limits. It is all a food that you, you get free, of course, that had made you forget your place, isn't it? But listen carefully, next time, if anybody passed by me without bowing, you have had it. No mercy would be shown to you any longer. What do you take us for? As we are maha like you do, and you take us for naive children. During, during to pass by me without bowing, think twice before doing any such thing again. At this, everyone would beg him again. No, no, master, we will uh, not let such a thing happen again. Please forgive us this time. The master, fuming with rage, uh, would walk away, grumbling and muttering to himself all the way back. The Maharman would return to their huts, but the master, the matter did not end it. Everybody then uh, vented their uh, wrath on the poor girl, the daughter-in-law, and took her to a uh, task for the sasu. This would be a fine opportunity to abuse her. The Sasra would join force with us. I wife, you bitch, Paru. Will you allow us to stay in this village or not? Do you know what havoc you would have caused today? Do you know how terrible it was for me today? The whole village has started spitting on my face. We eat their food, don't we? Should we pass them without bowing? Do, you, do your parents belong to the Kolhati caste? Don't they have this custom of bowing before the master of their village? Immediately the Sasu would scarce, sarcastically add her own bit to the uh, tirai. Her father must be a party. You know, that's why she isn't born. Kolhati. So, uh, what does she know about our custom? Impudent bitch, they are our masters. Do you understand? We must behave according to our custom. That's our religion. Was your mother and mother as so dunky that you behave so? Didn't she teach you anything? Your sasara moves among respectable people and you have blackened his face. Everybody, even the neighborhood and relatives would join the fray and abuse the girl to their heart's content. We used to, uh, we used to accompany the woman to sell firewood. They would be wearing saris that... Their sacred clothes stitch out of the rag stitch up together with the stitches as thick as figure. Even their rags were made of several pieces uh, put, together, put together. The pallor reached to their knees. A veil fell over their forehead. They, they wore the sari in their traditional way. The front pleats taken place and the legs stuck behind. There were caste rules uh, even in how the one, one struck the pallor. Mahar woman had to tuck them in a way that her borders remained hidden. Only high caste woman had pallor of wearing their sari in such a way that the borders could be seen. A Mahar woman was stopped, supposed to hide the border under the under the pleats. Otherwise, it was considered an offense to the high caste. Their forehead were smeared with the huge kumkum. Their their blouses were also made from rags. The, the tired and dusty Mahar would walk on the side of the road and the at most humility so as not to offend anyone. They tried to make themselves in, uh, inconspicuous as possible, hiding themselves from all others. They would walk through the lane where people from other lower castes. The lanes were also as uh, the Dangar Lane, Vin Vinkar Lane, Mali Lane, Teli Lane. Finally, they come to the Brahmin Lane. All their part would also be sold in the lane. Every Household in this land and chest high platform, like walk to prohibit and Mahars from the directly reaching the door. The Mahar woman would stand in the far off corner and platform and call out, Kaki firewood, the Mahar woman are here for firewood. 
the khaki would be sitting on the uh, on the swing slowly she would stop swinging and get down as leisurely pace to bargain with them she would offer one and a one and a half and two paisa for one bundle finally the the price would be accepted at five paisa for a two bundle the actual price for would be at least three paisa each uh, but we could but what could the woman do even uh, even god in trouble they say has to fall at the feet of the donkey even after the price is agreed upon the work of the mahar woman was not over the woman had to carry the bundle to the backyard or the inner courtyard of the house they had to untie and bundle the stickle of the stakes of the wood nearly neatly they after they had to pick up each stick and check it for any strand uh, of long hair or thread from their uh, sarees that may stuck to the wood the brahmin kaki the brahmin kaki sitting on the cool shed supervising this operation would keep shouting instructing after instruction listen carefully you dumb mar woman check the stick well if you overlook any of these threads sticking to the wood there will be a lot of trouble but what's that to you your carelessness will cost us heavily our house will get polluted then we'll have to polish and floor cow dung and wash all over uh, clothes even the rag in the house such trouble we will have to undergo for your foolishness and how will this uh, this god's tolerance uh, this they too will be polluted won't they that's what i'm telling you check the stick well the mar woman would check the bundles carefully saying kaki we have taken out every strand of their thread and from the stick each stick has check we have gone that made will pollute our house you are god on god's own people don't we know uh, even that a wee children curious about the various things lying in the kaki's courtyard would try to move about and touch them but one step forward and kaki would shout these idiotic mahar woman hey you why don't you bring these brats along why do you bring these brats along they will touch things and pollute everything tell them to sit quietly then our mahar woman would shout at us you bastard can't keep you quiet sit quietly in the one place look kaki these brats just follow us when we were come here hey you have don't touch anything you make mischief and we are kicked for no fault but what's that to you meanwhile all the sticks would be checked and as uh, stacked properly then the woman would carefully gather whatever stands for their uh, stands of hair and threads they uh, had found sticking in the wood hold them carefully in their palms and against go to the front of the house and stand away from the raised place from their palms outstretch in almost humility finally the kaki would throw uh, from the above to avoid any contact the couple of coins to each palm the same process was followed while selling grass as well the kaki would get the woman to carefully check each blade of the grass what a what a beastly thing this hindu religion is. let me tell you it's not pros pros purity and wealth that you enjoy it's it's a very it is the very life blood of the mahar mahar women sweat would have soaked the fire sometime when uh, thorns pick them blood thick blood tickle trickle and drip on the stick sometime they cut their own limbs instead of wood and blood pour down drench the wood and blood this it was very essence for the mahar women's life that was found sticking in the wood and yet the brahmin women objected to that they found sticking there when the mahar women labor in the field the corn gets wet with their sweat the same corn get to make you make you poor rich dishes and you feast on them with such evident relish your palaces are built with the a uh, soil soaked with the sweat and blood of the mahar but does it rot your skin your skin you you drink their blood and sleep comfortably on the bed or of their misery doesn't it pollute you then just the farmers pierce with the bullock's nose and insert the string through the nostril to control it you have pierced the mahar nose the string of ignorance and you have been flogging and as just the whip of pollution of pollution this is all your selfish religious religion that gave us has given to us but we now have learned how utterly worthless your religion is and once who has taught us this that one who has transformed us from beast into human being is the architect of our constitution that string the shining jewels of shilan satwa baba sahib ambedkar